yes, it's definitely Maimonides. How did we not know that? Since we know his handwriting so well. This is the Rambam one. Amazing. If you came to me, you know, 10 years ago and said, what's the most exciting thing? I probably would have said Bibles and so on. But now if you come to me, I will say something completely different because we've been working on it ever since. And it's not just us here in Cambridge. In fact, it's, you know, we're a tiny um, group compared to the wider world of people who are now working on the Geniza. Um, because the Geniza was digitized 10, 15 years ago. Um, very generous man in Canada gave money to digitize the whole collection. Um, and so we, our whole Cambridge collection is now available on the internet and consequently Geniza research has exploded around the world because people can sit at home and just sort through manuscripts and find interesting things and that's exactly what's now happening. So we have a colleague, colleague from, from Spain, Professor Delgado, we know him as Pepe, um, he's been working on putting together a book of Spanish documents, so documents from Al-Andalus that are in the Cairo Geniza because a lot of Jews from Al-Andalus either sent letters to Egypt because they had a strong cultural and trading uh, economic links, or they actually, like Judah Levi, um, Judah Levi, they, they actually traveled to Egypt. Um, so their documents ended up in Egypt and, in, and eventually ended up in the Cairo Geniza. So we have lots of documents from Al-Andalus um, and very early ones, you know, so 11th century and so on. Um, and uh, among those documents are some of the most famous figures of Jewish history. So Andalusians who end up in Egypt, Judah Halevi and Moses Maimonides being the two, you know, the two that everyone would name. But there are many, many others, of course. Um, um, but in compiling this collection of documents relating to Al-Andalus, our colleague Pepe um, looked at a manuscript that we had published years ago. And it's what we call a glossary. So um, because the Geniza society was multilingual and because it was multi-ethnic, as in Jews came from many parts of the Jewish world, there was sometimes a need for them to translate vocabulary so that they could understand each other. All Jews knew Hebrew, obviously they prayed in the Middle Ages, they read the sources, so Hebrew and Aramaic, where you know, it was the responsibility of every educated person to know these. Um, but if they didn't come from the Islamic world, then they wouldn't necessarily be Arabic speakers or Persian speakers if they came from, the, from far in the East. Um, and especially in the 12th century, following the Crusades and what the Crusaders did in Europe, we find in Cairo a lot of Jews coming from Christian lands. Uh, and so we have a lot of figures popping up from southern France, northern Spain, Ashkenaz generally, in Egypt. And they start to leave um, their documents in the Cairo Geniza record. And so in looking through these documents, um, we found a glossary of words in Judeo-Arabic, so Arabic and Hebrew characters, which is the usual way that the Jews of the, of the Geniza world of the Middle Ages wrote their Arabic, because they all learned how to write Hebrew at school, but they spoke Arabic, Arabic was their first language, Hebrew was their first written language, they put the two together and you get Judeo-Arabic. So it's a word list in Judeo-Arabic of relatively common words like meat, bread, black, white, and underneath it were words in what we identified when we first published it years ago, my colleague um, uh, Dr. Avi Shiftiel published it, um, as words in an unknown Romance language, so Spanish, Italian, a Romance language of some kind. He published that. It was fine. It was nice. Um, here was a, a list for someone who was possibly, you know, arriving in Egypt and needed to understand basic words to live, you know, how to buy bread, you know, how to describe colours, that kind of thing. Um, but it was only when my colleague Pepe was looking at it recently that he pointed out what should have been obvious to us <laughs> It ridiculously wasn't obvious to us, but should have been that the whole document is in Moses Maimonides' handwriting. So it's in the Rambam's handwriting, which we know really well, because we have documents signed by him, whole letters so signed. He by wrote him. the document. He wrote it. He wrote this list. So this list is is the first time ever we have evidence of Moses Maimonides writing a language other than Hebrew or Arabic. Right. He wrote most of his works in Arabic, in Judeo-Arabic mostly. Um, he obviously wrote the Mishneh Torah and other things in Hebrew. You know, he was obviously a master of both languages. He, he had had a good education. He could write Arabic script too. So we do have examples of him writing Arabic as well as Judeo-Arabic. But we have, never got, we have never had any examples of him writing a European language. And so what this word list is, probably, and my colleague Pepe is now arguing, is that Maimondes wrote all the words in Arabic, and these were words obviously he used in everyday life. And he was trying to remember words from his life back in Al-Andalus 
from the Romance language spoke, spoken by the common people of Al-Andalus, so the Spanish dialect that was spoken in addition to Arabic. So the kind of words that he would have kn known if he'd gone to the market, right, to talk to the peasants, you know, to buy food or whatever. He was trying to remember that. And because he couldn't, he was probably asking people who were now coming from northern F Spain, southern France for help. As a result, so it's the word, so if you look, there's like aswad, right, black in Arabic. And the word under it is negro. Right? Yeah. Um, um, but in some cases, the words are not obvious in Spanish. And so it's what seems to have happened. And sometimes, the because he, he uses nikud as well, and sometimes the nikud is not what we would expect. So what's quite, quite likely is happening is that some of his informants are giving him different dialects of, the, of romance. So it's a kind of mixed picture that he's getting. So what we have is important for a number of reasons. One, it's by Moses Maimonides, you know, the greatest Jewish thinker of the Middle Ages. Um, it's the first time we have evidence that he actually knew any Spanish, you know. We, you could assume he did because he grew up in Spain, but you, you can't be sure because he lived very much in an Islamic, Jewish Islamic environment, learnt Arabic, you know, read all his books in Arabic and so on. But also, it's some of the earliest and most important attested vocabulary for a now lost Romance language, because that, that, the, the language of Al-Andalus disappeared after the reconquest. The, you know, when, when the Christians took back Spain, that language spoken in Andalus just disappeared and, you know, northern, the northern Spanish, whatever, took over. So that is the kind of Geniza in a nutshell. It's vitally important to, to people who are interested in the history of Judaism, the figures of Judaism, Jewish studies generally. But also, it turns out to be extremely interesting on the social history of the movement of Jews around the Mediterranean in this period, 12th to 13th century. And it gives us linguistic information that we don't have from, from hardly any other source. So, I mean, that's you know, just in, a, in, in one document shows quite what the Geniza can do. And that was purely by chance discovered literally a month or two months ago by my colleague Pepe, who suspected it was by Maimonides and, you know, sent an email to, to me and to my, to my Israeli colleague, Dr. Amir Ashur, who was here. Uh, who know who he was in Israel at the time, but you know, he asked me to go and check the manuscript. We checked it together and yes, it's definitely Maimonides. How did we not know that? It's, we know his handwriting so well. This is the Rambam one. Um, and if you look, so, so um, for instance, here you have, um, in Hebrew characters, so you have laham, which is, is, is meat in Arabic. Yeah, obviously in, in, in Hebrew it's bread, lechem, but in Arabic it's meat. And underneath it, again, in the Rambam's handwriting, especially you can see the way he writes his kuf, which is very like the Rambam, it says carne. So, you know, carne in, in Spanish, meat. Yeah, carne is Spanish. Yeah. Latin word, yeah. And so, and what you have here are all of these sort of everyday words for, you know, and, and in some cases he doesn't have a Spanish word because he doesn't know the word. So, you know, death and so on, he doesn't have a word for. Um, but here, yeah, so here you have aswad and negro. Um, but you can see on this, on, on, on the right-hand side, he doesn't have Spanish words for any of these. He doesn't know the, the words for them. Showing that, that, you know, he had an imperfect memory for the language that he might have known, you know, when he was young. Now, if you ask, how do we know this is his handwriting? Well, the, the most famous discovery of the Rambam that was made from the Karaganiza was this letter written by him that was published in relatively early days of Geniza research. And this is a whole letter in his handwriting, and it's a letter of introduction. So um, uh, it's introducing a man who has arrived from Morocco and he's gonna settle in Egypt. And he knows Maimondi, so Maimondi has written him a letter of introduction to carry with him to the community where he's going to live so that he can get help from the Jewish community to pay the jizya poll tax that he has to pay to the Islamic authorities. And this one is unusual because it's signed with Moses Maimonides' full name, Moshe Berabi Maimun Zatzal, because his father at this stage is dead. Moshe Berabi Maimun. And that is his characteristic handwriting, the way he writes the final hay, this loopy final hay, the way he joins up the shin and the hay, and the mem and the shin and the hay is very characteristic of the, the Sephardi Andalusian handwriting that Maimonides has. When Maimonides arrives in Egypt, no one else writes like this. People write in Egypt, they write this square Hebrew, a bit like the Dead Sea Scrolls. They don't join up letters. When Maimonides arrives, 
he, he has this Andalusian style of flowing Hebrew writing which becomes fashionable and you find many more examples of it after him. So because we recognize his handwriting from that, if you compare the two manuscripts, although in this letter, you know, he is writing carefully because it's a letter of introduction and in the other one it's probably something for his own use, but you can see that the handwriting is the same. And once you recognize the Rambam's handwriting, you can find it all over the Karaganesa. So here, this is a responsum. So this is a she'ela and a tshuva. The she'ela is here. You can see in the very black ink, this is the original she'ela to the Rambam, written in Judeo-Arabic. Um, it says, you know, what does the honorable um, holy, you know, great Rabbeinu Adonenu Moshe Harav Agadol Be Israel Sanhedra Raba Yechid Hador. Um, all of the the kind of um, uh, glorious titles that my mother has. What does he say about Fi Reuven, um, who had a nephew, and um, the nephew got married, had a child. The nephew died, and a year later, the child died. Now the man would like to marry his nephew's widow, is it acceptable? And I believe the, the, the point here, why it was a, why they had to write to the Rambam to ask for an answer to this was because there was a child, that complicates the issue, but the fact the child had died means technically there isn't a child anymore in the relationship. So some people would have argued, yes, it's fine for them to get married, other people would have argued, no, the presence of a child means they can't get married. So they asked Maimonides, and then the answer in the, in the Rambam's own handwriting is the bottom in Judeo Arabic, beginning Al Jawab, meaning, meaning Hat Shuvah, the, the, the answer. They can get married, while Katabah Moshe signed Moses. Um, he doesn't explain why they can get married. He doesn't explain how he, he reaches this opinion. You know, does he get it from the Mishnah or the Talmud or, or from other sources? He doesn't say. He just says they can do it. Um, with a, the kind of authority that suggests, you know, it's, it's suggestive of the authority he had in Egypt when he wrote this, that he could get away with just saying something like that and people that's, would, you know, uh, wave that and say, that's fine. Amazing. Dr. Uh, Alfred, uh, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure.